talking about China, a country where, if you look at their books, you'll clearly be able to see why they call it Red China. Recently, in an event celebrated by economics wonks and ignored by literally everybody else, their government held its annual economic policy summit. Five topics were at the forefront, and one of them was particularly surprising. First, the economy, which, yeah, an economic policy summit, I'd expect that would come up. Second, they talked about hidden debt, which, if you think America owes China a lot of debt, you should see what it owes itself. Yeah, there was some clever accounting that went on there to help them pay for a ton of infrastructure. Third, they actually passed a foreign investment law that was designed to calm most of America's trade war concerns. And it was received in the West as, that's neat, but there's an election coming up in two years that we really have to keep covering. I heard Beto's running. Fourth, and this was the what topic, but they talked about the Xinjiang region of China. A region of China infamous for its re-education centers that have held as many as 1.5 million people without charge. And don't worry, they're definitely not that bad, because when reporters toured the camps, they were greeted with people singing, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Nothing suspicious there, let's just hope the people clap their hands. Lastly, and this might surprise most of you, but trade talks were not a major part of the conversation. Although, at different points, if you read between the lines, you could get sort of a sense for how the Chinese government was feeling and thinking about all of this. So let's get right into it. This annual event sets out China's political and economic goals for the coming year, so it will have a huge impact on both domestic affairs as well as foreign policy. Around 5,000 delegates from China's top two political parties are gathering in Beijing. And among them will be President Xi Jinping and other high-level officials. Yes, the event of the season. It was definitely a star-studded event for a very particular type of star. So let's get started with the economy. The problem is, the Chinese economy is slowing down. Specifically, China lowered their annual growth rate to 6 to 6.5%. Now in America, complaining about 6% GDP growth is like the kid who whines about getting a 98% on the test. Oh, I feel so bad for you. What a victim you are. So how are they going to address this slowdown issue? Well, the message on the economy was clear. China won't resort to debt-fueled stimulus. So Matt, we heard from Premier Li Keqiang, who had an opportunity to flesh out some of those priorities. And what he wanted to start off by saying was what they didn't plan to do, China's officials, which was and is to flood the economy with liquidity, he said. Not throwing money at your problems sounds politically untenable. Instead, something unprecedented happened. They announced almost 2 trillion yuan of tax cuts which comes to $300 billion. Apparently, yes, cutting taxes is a thing you can do in communist countries. This announcement came from Premier Li Keqiang, a man whose position is essentially what you would get if the Senate and the House got blended together and he was the leader. He's Speaker Polonil, except, ah, not the scariest thing I've ever seen. Sorry for putting that image in your head. Also, Li Keqiang is actually worried about budget deficits. He plans to finance this tax cut by taking 1 trillion yuan from the profits of state enterprises and financial institutions, as well as mobilizing existing idle funds. Yeah, we'll take a trillion from companies and the rest. Yeah, I'm sure we have a few hundred billion just lying around here somewhere. The tax cut will be to the value added tax, which will accomplish the impossible and somehow make things in China cheaper. This will provide a boost to the Chinese manufacturing and retail sectors. The other big non-debt increasing method of stimulating the Chinese economy was to get international companies to start investing more in China. They fast-tracked this foreign investment law, largely we suspect as a result of their attempts to try to show to the US that they are really going to make an effort to level the playing field. This brings us to our second big takeaway from the summit, a new foreign investment law. This new law is a grab bag of victories for the Trump administration. It bans forced technology transfers, which sounds great, but according to state-owned TV... The forced technology transfers of China claim is fake news. China has never had a policy forcing technology transfer from foreign companies. It has never signed an agreement on forced technology transfer, nor received any complaint 
from foreign companies. Right. So anyways, that thing that's definitely not happening, well now it's really definitely not happening. It also says that China will treat Chinese state-owned companies, Chinese privately owned companies, and foreign companies equally. In the past, China has heavily both explicitly and implicitly favored state-owned companies. Because, well, you can take a trillion yuan from them at a moment's notice if you want to pay for a tax cut. If a state-owned company and a privately owned company are competing for a project, I wouldn't stake my future on that privately owned company. Throw in a foreign company and you'd have better luck actually learning how to get $10,000 a day at home using one of those YouTube tutorials. This law would make applications for operating licenses equal amongst all firms and say that the government will provide equal support for all types of firms. To ban, for example, forced tech transfer. They're going to allow foreign businesses to be viewed by local governments and others as on an equal footing as Chinese companies. There's even going to be an appeals system for foreign businesses if they get denied a contract, for example. This would help China by, A, maybe it will end this trade war, although unfortunately for them, Trump's foreign policy advisor team hasn't mentioned this one on their daytime show yet. So that's probably not going to happen. And B, if it works, it will lead to a significant increase in foreign investment in China, where it should save the Chinese government some money in the long term. The operating term here is, of course, if it works. Because... One big problem, which is the lack of an enforcement mechanism for this particular law. Indeed, there's no real way to make sure that these uh, criminal penalties are actually handed out. And mostly, one of the big issues here is that a lot of the courts here in China, or most of the courts, all the courts here in China, are actually subject to the orders of the government in Beijing. So we might have to file this unenforceable law right next to how, in Connecticut, it's illegal for a barber to hum a tune while cutting your hair. Or in Kentucky, one may not dye a duckling blue and offer it for sale unless more than six are for sale at once. Which, Kentucky, you guys are having a problem with that? This brings us to the third problem China's trying to solve, and it's a weird one. This whole idea of off the books local government debt. This is where we enter into the terrain of, boy, did those Enron accountants get together with Paul Manafort to run the local Chinese government? China's main objection to increasing their government debt is that they're trying to handle this massive and largely nebulous chunk of regional debt. Again, all off the books. Because what government would want to keep a record of its finances? S&P Global estimated in October that hidden debt totals about 40 trillion yuan or 6 trillion dollars. And if you're anything like me, you're probably hoping to yourselves before he talks about the solution, I just really want him to get a little bit sidetracked and tell me what hidden government debt is. I mean, you can't bring up trillions in off-the-book debts and leave that unaddressed. So basically... The local government is not allowed to issue debt, so they're not allowed to borrow, basically. Well, that rule worked for all of five minutes. Local governments can't issue debt. There we go, that's the line in the sand. How are you going to cross it? Well, if your local government were to, say, start a state-owned construction company that issues the debt, that's A-OK. -okay. I mean, companies can take on debt. You add on top of that the implicit backing of the debt by the regional government that created that company, and you have yourself a recipe for a lot of money and zero accountability. It's basically the same thing as the regional government issuing the debt, except a lot more bureaucratic and probably creating quite a few additional unnecessary jobs in the process. So what's the solution? Well, it's a twofold approach of having China's largest state-owned bank refinance some of the local government debt. You know, giving them more favorable and longer term payment schedules. Also, it's helping China figure out just how much they owe and getting some of those figures back on the books. The second prong is they're requiring some regional governments to sell off state-owned assets like office buildings and houses in order to pay down this debt. So now to the final two items of the evening. And don't worry, these will be quite a bit briefer. First, the trade war. And yes, I realize that mentioning the trade war at the 11th hour of a video about China's economy might seem strange, but it just wasn't that huge of a focus on the event. 
The Chinese officials addressed the trade negotiations overnight at the opening of the National People's Congress. The country's commerce minister said trade talks have been difficult and its premier warned of a tough struggle as China's growth target was cut to the lowest in nearly three decades. It didn't even make the official agenda. But you did get a dose of snide remarks saying that the United States demands, or at least some of them, were nitpicky. And it really came to a head when Vice Commerce Minister Wang Shou Ren called us out by saying that any mechanism trying to enforce an agreement must be two ways. Now that might not sound like the sickest of burns, but considering we're currently being sued by a massive Chinese tech company, Huawei, for what they say is unconstitutionally refusing to work with them. Well, there was a little shade being thrown at us with that comment. Now to the final piece, which is again not the biggest deal but important to know. China commented on the mass detentions of Muslims in Xinjiang. They specifically said the camps are going to stay there for a long time, which is probably not what most of you were hoping I'd say. Specifically regional governor Shorat Zakir and man trying to force choke an intern was quoted as saying, <clears throat> the fight against instability, extremism, and successionism is long, complex, and intense. We can't relax for a moment at any time. So not much reading between the lines required there to see that this detention program is not going to end anytime soon. And with that, those are the major takeaways from the 2019 Chinese Two Sessions meeting. Between cutting growth protections, tax cuts, a promising foreign investment law, tackling regional debt, throwing shade at American negotiators, and announcing a continuation of their controversial Muslim detainment program, I'd say they have their work cut out for them in the coming year. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.